Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Synthetic Intelligence Forum. My name is Vic, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to an excellent session today on quantum information experiments. Uh, we have the privilege of being joined today by uh, Dr. Adrian Lupashku from the University of Waterloo, the Department of Physics and uh, Astronomy. And um, Professor Lupashku is an associate professor and associate chair in this department. And he is an accomplished scholar, a world leading researcher in this field. So without further ado, I'd like to now welcome Professor Lupashku to this stream. Adrian, welcome. And as I bring up your slides, perhaps I can uh, request you to maybe introduce yourself a little bit. Tell us about your academic background and your research focus, and then uh, we can dive right into the presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Vic, uh, for the invitation. It's it's great to have uh, this opportunity to talk about um, uh, research in uh, in uh, our field. And um, uh, yeah, to, so to start, I'll, I'll I'll tell you a bit about myself. So um, I'm I'm currently an associate professor in the Department of Physics and uh, Astronomy at the at the University of Waterloo. I'm also a member of the Institute for Quantum Computing, um, um, which is a, an institute uh, here in Waterloo, bringing together uh, uh, a very large group working on uh, various areas in, in quantum information. And um, I, uh, so I, I started my academic path at the University of Bucharest, where I studied physics. And then uh, I, um, I did a PhD at Delft University of Technology um, where I, I worked in, in, in the field of superconducting devices when this field was still uh, uh, at its very beginnings. And um, uh, then I did a postdoctoral research. Um, uh, I, had, I had a postdoctoral research fellowship uh, in, in Paris at uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure, where I, where I worked on another um, type of quantum system used for quantum information, namely um, atomic systems. And um, uh, uh, following this, I, I, I moved to Waterloo in two, 2009, uh, where uh, I um, uh, continued uh, my, my work on, on superconducting quantum devices. Uh, so, so here in Waterloo, we are working on a range of topics in the field with a focus on the physics of, uh, of these systems, but also tackling uh, uh, engineering uh, issues and, and in general issues related to implementation of um, of quantum uh, devices and quantum computers, and uh, also um, for half a year now in the in the department, I, I have also uh, taken the role as associate chair, uh, where I uh, uh, am uh, uh, looking at the, our undergraduate program. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, this is what I what I wanted to share with you about my. Um, uh, my uh, uh, some of my my bio, um, yeah, and um, with this I I could uh, I, I'll I'll get started I guess in my with my presentation. So I have to say it was very interesting to be asked to talk about this. I I, I um, it's it's a, it's a, it's great to have to have the opportunity to give a kind of a general perspective on 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 the field, uh, and and it is something that that uh, gave me an opportunity to reflect about where where the field is currently. And I'll start um, um, first with with, uh, with um, just a, a quick perspective on what the field of uh, of quantum computing is. So this field is at the confluence of quantum physics and computing. Uh, quantum physics was born in the early 20th century, and um, it essentially changed the way we look at the world around us. Um, what is interesting is that for uh, for most of the 20th century, interacting with quantum systems was, was essentially limited to the uh, to, to the scope of experimental physics, and it was focused on understanding uh, essentially manifestations of quantum mechanics and, and and deepening the understanding on 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 quantum physics. And it had applications in areas such as condensed matter and chemistry. Um, but already uh, uh, several tens of years ago, there were uh, some some devices that used quantum mechanics to to improve um, on on applications. And um, uh, two well known such devices are the atomic clock and the laser. Uh, computing, um, uh, which is the, the other the, the 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 second point of origin for the field, um, is is of course. Um, uh, 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 so 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 uh, uh, present in our lives, the the quantum computing race that led to the current status of computing started somewhere around the second half of the 20th century, and essentially uh, we got to this point um, 
through a very spectacular development in, in technology. So essentially, we, we, we've seen the sustained exponential rate of, of advancements in technology over, over decades now. So um, quantum computing is a fundamentally new approach to, to computing. Um, there is already a very um, a rigorous uh, foundational basis for working quantum computers. This is not to say that, that this area of, uh, of theoretical research is, is finalized, but there is a list of foundation for how you can build quantum computers. Uh, at the same time, the development of quantum hardware is very, uh, very much uh, in, its, uh, in its early uh, stages. Um, and when I look at uh, developing quantum computer hardware, this is uh, a daunting task. Um, essentially, um, uh, uh, you could say that uh, quite an achievement. And um, on key performance metrics. Uh, and the other aspect is that quantum computers are actually building very heavily on regular computing technology. So, so classical computers are essentially part of, of quantum, uh, quantum computers in the way this technology is, is put together. And um, today uh, I'm going to talk about the connections between the development of classical computing and, and, and quantum computing hardware. Um, so, so looking at this connection between classical and quantum uh, quantum computing is um, is very uh, uh, important because um, uh, first of all, uh, from regular computing technology, uh, we can learn a lot about um, uh, about the um, um, uh, scaling. Uh, so, so essentially, the fact that we we have now uh, uh, CPUs with billions of transistors happened because there was a roadmap for development and, and specific scaling rules that, that guided the development of this technology. Uh, the other important aspect, which I've already mentioned briefly, is that regular computers are part of, of, of quantum computers um, because uh, they are used as part of running algorithms. They are used to compile quantum gates and in error correction. And then, um, uh, in, in, uh, so in addition to this, we also have uh, co a classical computing technology uh, playing a role in, um, in uh, control signals that are used in, in, in quantum computing, which is a case that, that, uh, that comes up in the, in the field uh, that I'm working in. And uh, I'm going to discuss these connections with a, with a particular focus on uh, superconducting quantum devices, although I should say that more, more generally, um, uh, some of the points that I'm going to discuss here uh, apply uh, to, uh, to, uh, to all implementations of, of quantum computers. So, um, um, let me, uh, to, to, to introduce a few basic notions, I want to say just a bit about what quantum computing is. Um, so um, in quantum computing, uh, you, you have this, um, uh, fundamentally new notion that you're looking at units for storing quantum information, where instead of having states zero and one to, to store information, you actually allow uh, su superpositions of these states to occur. So a superposition is this combination of state zero and one with um, arbitrary numbers placed in, in front. So in a sense, quantum computers store analog uh, information uh, then uh, we have a generalization of uh, registers in, in classical computing. Uh, so registers are these strings of bits. Uh, so here you have a, a register of n bits. Um, the analog, namely a quantum register, is now a superposition of all the combinations of strings um, formed by the, the values of these bits. So for n bits, there will be two power n combinations. And, and, and you, as you increase the number of qubits, you have these large superpositions with, with many uh, of, of these numbers uh, describing them. And, and this uh, already gives a sense of, of the power of quantum computing in terms of storing um, so much uh, information. Uh, and finally, uh, there is an analog of the gates, so the logical operations that you, you apply to, to build um, uh, algorithms. Uh, in quantum computers, the gates are replaced by so-called unitary transformations. 
And these are, these are essentially multiplication by matrices of the states represented by, by, um, uh, by, by this complex number. So if you think about these numbers here as, as forming a vector, the unitary transformations are, are multiplications by, by a matrix. Um, so, um, uh, the the question of, of uh, how much better quantum computers are than classical computers, even at this stage, is a heavily um, debated question. And at the very least, uh, one 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 should say that uh, uh, this is still very much an area of development. Um, uh, one one point to keep in mind is that um, uh, quantum algorithms essentially. Uh, uh, keep being invented. Uh, you don't have a simple translation uh, process for classical algorithms, uh, from classical algor algorithms to quantum algorithms. But there are already um, enough algorithms that, that make the, the task of developing uh, quantum computers um, very motivating. Uh, two very well-known examples are factoring of large numbers and, and search where, where, where uh, significant speedups are expected uh, by using quantum computers. So now uh, we we know that the cost of building a quantum computer will be um, uh, will be huge. Um, essentially, to build quantum computers, uh, you need to uh, get control uh, of take control of quantum systems at a level never achieved before. So we need we need to have these very complex quantum systems. We need to control them. We need to isolate them from the environment to achieve the, the high level of control that is needed. And also, we need to find ways to uh, to measure them. Um, the, there is uh, at least uh, one uh, one way to summarize what you need to build of, of quantum computers in terms of the Di Vincenzo criteria, uh, and uh, these are listed here. So essentially, you need uh, firstly a scalable physical system with with well characterized quantum bits. Uh, then you need the ability to initialize these qubits in a well defined state. You also need long decoherence times, um, and I will, um, I will I will here say a few things about decoherence. I will not get too much into the technical details of it, but decoherence is the process by which um, uh, quantumness of, of states is is lost, and um, the longer uh, you can maintain coherence of a quantum system, the the better the operations on it are. So having systems that maintain quantum coherence over a long time is, is uh, critical for quantum information. Um, the fourth criteria, uh, so for, sorry, fourth criterion is that you need a universal set of quantum gates. So these are um, uh, the, the operations that you, that you apply to, to quantum computers and you need enough of them in order to be able to achieve any type of transformation. And finally, you need to be able to, to measure these states. So um, when um, we um, uh, now uh, look at computing technology for, for the regular nowadays computers, uh, it, it is important to, um, uh, to, to think in, in the context of, 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 this, um, of this discussion here of the fact that uh, there was a very long road to uh, to to the um, uh, situation that we we have today in terms of computing technology so we have these extremely powerful machines that achieve very complex computational tasks but um, it took a long time to to get here and what is also important to um, uh, to, to uh, reflect over is the fact that while we now have a dominant uh, implementation of computing technology in terms of transistors, to get here was a very uh, uh, long uh, process where other types of, of um, devices were used to do computing. And this started with uh, mechanical devices, and then it continued uh, with electromechanical devices, then electronic devices other than transistors, such as vacuum tubes. And finally, uh, this um, uh, road to powerful computing settled on transistors implemented using semiconductors as the um, as the technology to 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 achieve this uh, this task. Um, so so now uh, the the core of uh, uh, computing um, technology nowadays uh, is the field effect transistor, and um, I'm, I'm here I'm showing here a diagram from from this. Um, 
uh, a very interesting book that that discusses the transistor and its its um, its evolution over time. Uh, essentially, this device is is um, is made of, of semiconductors. Uh, you have this property that the conduction, so the electrical conduction between two terminals, is being tuned by the voltage you apply to to a different terminal. So essentially, the voltage applied here can change the concentration of carriers thereby changing the resistance between these two terminals and this can be used to uh, to change um, uh, to, to to change another voltage somewhere in the circuit so you, so you have this uh, in a sense this logical operation that is is enabled by by this um, uh, by, by this behavior of the of the device um, so now um, in order to get to the level of technology of today with uh, billions of transistors on a in a in a single um, uh, CPU, uh, there was a there was a very uh, long uh, effort that that uh, was was pursued, and and this this effort is 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 probably one of the most uh, significant achievements uh, of, of of humans in in that it took us from uh, the state of te technology um, uh, uh, more than fifty years ago, where these integrated chips had. Um, about a thousand uh, transistors to the state of today, where um, where you have, uh, as I said, billions of them, and um, and this uh, this change in the number of transistors over time was uh, was observed to to follow this uh, this exponential rate. This is um, this is Moore's law, and uh, it basically predicts that uh, every two years the number of of um, transistors on microchips doubles and. Um, and again, this is an impressive achievement. It requires continuous upgrades to to technology in order for for this to happen. And um, uh, to to achieve uh, to achieve this um, uh, this rate of progress, uh, there were very significant uh, device physics and engineering challenges to overcome. And um, um, there was essentially an approach uh, uh, called scaling that that um, brought us here, which is essentially about the fact that in order to uh, to keep on uh, improving uh, the the performance of of, um, of processors, you need to miniaturize transistors, and you need to do this in a way that um, that preserves the the working properties of these transistors when combined together in in processing units or, or memory elements and and there are a set of rules that you need to apply in order for for this to happen and and these rules had to be followed uh, very rigorously they had to be continued re-examined and and understood as challenges with scaling be became uh, greater and greater um so um so now um, I, I would like to turn to um, to uh, uh, to to a um, to a discussion of, of of quantum devices for technology, and and I would actually like to 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 point out at first that um, quantum mechanics is in fact important even in in what we call conventional devices. So when you when you think in fact of the of the field effect transistor that I showed earlier, quantum mechanics is in fact defining for the way in which the device works so so um, you deal actually with quantum states in a in a semiconductor device that need to be understood but in in some ways this is still considered to be a classical device because uh, the behavior is is deterministic so you don't have any role that is played for that that is played by quantum mechanics um, uh in 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 terms of the, some of its uh, uh more more the, so, some of the more subtle uh, if effects it, it may have but nevertheless quantum mechanics is part of it and the same can be said about other devices used in technology such as the quantum hall effect so here as well you have quantum mechanics coming into play when you look at this uh, amazing property that the resistance of a device is quantized uh, in units that are related to fundamental constants uh, but again this device is is not necessarily considered a quantum device as 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 per um, so, so some some of the criteria that um, that um, that are taken to, uh, to 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 use that phrase and essentially what we tend to call uh, quantum devices nowadays are devices that essentially make use of um, um, 
features such as superposition, interference, and uh, entanglement uh, in in their uh, in their operation. So this is very um, uh, this is very important. Uh, and um, and again, um, uh, such devices have actually had a very long uh, uh, history. So. Um, so this started with um, uh, atomic uh, clocks, and I apologize, I have the wrong reference here. So, so atomic clocks were um, uh, uh, are, are quite an old uh, device. So, so, so in atomic clocks, you you use quantum properties to keep time with an amazing level of precision, and then you also um, um, another type of quantum device are, are magnetometers, where you rely on superpositions of spins to to detect magnetic fields with um, Again, very high uh, precision. So, so th those are examples of of, of, of quantum devices, um, and uh, they achieve uh, they achieve specific tasks. Uh, now, uh, I would like to to talk a bit about quantum devices that are used to build quantum computers. Um, so, um, the first thing to note is that uh, we are currently at a stage in the development of quantum computers where we haven't settled yet on a specific technology. Uh, so at this point, there are in fact several technologies that are interesting for implementing quantum computers. This include um, uh, photons um, uh, and, and atoms. These are some of the, um, these, uh, these are devices that we, we are used to from, from uh, introductory quantum mechanics and they are the devices that, that where quantum effects were observed um, for the first time. But more recently, there are other types of devices that are being um, uh, explored for implementing uh, quantum computers. Um, uh, one such device uh, uh, is, is formed by defects in a high quality uh, crystal where the quantum state of these defects can be used to encode quantum information. And then you also have uh, devices that are uh, in fact similar to transistors through in the fact that they are um, they are made uh, they, are, they, are, they are fabricated so they are they are really uh, built, built up so to say out of metals and semiconductors and dielectrics and so on where quantum states are are, are held uh, in um, in um, in systems that have a large that is that have a size that is, is much larger than than typical atomic sizes, so um, uh, the the type of uh, the type of technology that I'm going to talk today focuses on this type of device, solid state devices. And um, next, I, I want to go through a brief introduction of of what how these devices are made. So. Um, uh, these devices are, are, are based on superconductors and uh, superconductivity is this um, intriguing state of, of solids where below certain temperatures, electrons become ordered. They, they form the so-called Cooper pairs. And these Cooper pairs can flow through, um, through metal without any dissipation. Now, uh, when you take two superconductors and you separate them by a tunnel barrier, you... Um, introduce uh, this possibility for Cooper pairs to actually tunnel across this barrier. And this tunneling process is also um, uh, a process that preserves quantum coherence. So these Cooper pairs, as they move from one state to another, uh, can be described at all times via, as a, via a quantum model, so, so through, through quantum state. Uh, and there is a simple way to describe this a bit more formally in terms of um, uh, a change between states with and Cooper pairs uh, having crossed this barrier and the state with N plus one Cooper pairs having crossed the barrier. So this is essentially a single tunneling event uh, between, these two, uh, between these two pieces of superconducting metal. Uh, another effect that has to be uh, taken into account is the fact that as uh, these Cooper pairs are, are um, crossing the barrier, there is an, an electrostatic energy that is added to the system uh, this can be written, in fact, in a fairly simple way in terms of the charge square divided by twice the capacitance, so a simple formula from electrostatics. And, um, and in fact, putting these two ingredients together, namely tunneling of Cooper pairs across the barrier and the electrostatic energy build up as you have these Cooper pairs moving around, you end up with a formal description of, of, of such a device um, based on um, uh, two operators. So, so these are um, uh, fundamental objects in, in the description of quantum, 
quantum systems. Uh, they, you can think about them as matrices um, that describe transformations of the quantum system. And then another fundamental um, 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 object is the is the Hamiltonian of the system, which which has the form given here. So essentially, you can think about this as being the energy of the system, and it has two contributions: one from the uh, electrostatic energy, and the other one from tunneling. And the reason I wanted to spend a bit of time on this is just to illustrate this amazing property that uh, essentially you start with a device that is uh, um, fairly complicated. It has a, a very large number of atoms, so its its size can be as high as uh, as large as sorry as, as hundred micrometers or so. So these devices you can almost see them by by eye. And you can see them by eye, in fact, in some cases. But then you, you have this very interesting situation that the, the behavior from the point of view of quantum mechanics is described by this very simple operator. And in fact, the model ends up being as, um, um, as simple as that of a single atom. This by itself is, is, is amazing. And in fact, it took, um, it took, uh, development in physics over decades to reach this stage. And, and before saying a bit more about this, um, I just wanted to point out that um, when you think about these devices, uh, you can essentially um, uh, control these parameters that show up in the Hamiltonian. So that's another interesting property. So you have an atom-like system, but its fundamental constants, in a sense, can be controlled. And this, these, are, uh, these devices are sometimes called artificial atoms. And the energy scales are um, in the range of, of gigahertz. So these transitions are uh, transitions that occur at um, uh, typically 1 to 20 gigahertz, which means that in order to induce transitions between quantum states, you need to use microwave signals, which is, uh, which is a very uh, interesting distinguishing feature when you compare these systems with regular atoms where fundamentally uh, uh, fundamental transitions uh, take place at... Um, much larger frequencies. So, um, so um, as I said, uh, the fact that we can describe these so complex solid state devices with a very simple model is essential for quantum uh, computing. And uh, the fact that this is possible was the result of uh, over a century of uh, accumulation of knowledge, starting with the discovery of superconductivity and then in, in 1911 and then explaining it in 1956. Then the discovery of the Josephson effect, which is the tunneling effect I mentioned earlier. And then um, more recent developments uh, where these questions around quantum behavior of these uh, macro scale devices was, uh, was understood in more depth. And finally, uh, demonstrating superpositions in these devices in the late 1990s. So, so these are all, uh, these are all developments that led to the, um, to the, to the current uh, state of, of things where we can understand these devices with very well-founded quantum mechanical models. And um, just to just to show an example of, of how such a device looks like, I took here a picture from something made in our lab, where essentially you see uh, you see a chip. Uh, so so this chip is is um, very similar to chips used in microelectronics for for transistors, but it's different in the ways you you build these devices. So it's it still is made of silicon, and use metallic layers, but these metallic layers have to be made of um, of superconductors. And then you have other elements around that are used to interact with, uh, in this case, two, two quantum bits on this chip. So zooming in uh, on, on one of these uh, quantum bits, you, you see this feature here um, that has a size of a couple of hundred microns. And um, zooming in a, a bit farther, you see the, the key elements, the Josephson junctions. So these are these overlap areas here where Cooper pairs can, can, uh, can tunnel across. So what is interesting about making these devices is that um, many, of, many of the techniques are actually based on techniques that are used in microelectronics to make, um, to make chips for, for, for computers and for other uh, applications. Uh, and, and there are, of course, some, some adjustments that are made to work with specific superconducting materials and also tackle other issues. Also, just to give you a flavor of, about what it, what it means to work with this type of devices, I'm showing here some pictures again from our lab where the kind of chip that I showed earlier is, uh, is placed um, uh, uh, on a printer circuit board so that you can connect it to electrical signals. 
and then this has to be placed inside the cryostat. So, so the temperatures that you need to operate these devices at has, have to be very low in order to firstly reach con uh, superconductivity and secondly um, see um, uh, uh, long coherence times. And then this shows here um, uh, a part of our lab where you see the cryostat with the device placed somewhere inside here. And then um, a, a bunch of electronics that is used to, to send signals to control the states. So um, now um, uh, I, I want to, um, uh, to talk a bit about the development of, of these devices over years. And um, uh, this, uh, this graph here for, from a very interesting recent review shows how the coherence times of, of these superconductive devices have changed over years. And, and please note the fact that here the, the time axis goes from um, uh, the, the late uh, 1990s uh, up to the uh, 2020. So this paper is published 2020. And then you, you have on this axis on an exponential scale, and I need to emphasize this, you have the coherence times. So, so these coherence times are changing uh, exponentially with, with time, uh, uh, roughly. And... Uh, and again, it's so firstly, coherence times are a key performance metric. So the, the longer these coherence times and assuming that other properties are, are, are preserved, um, the, the better the, the, the quantum gates that you can apply are. So this is, uh, this is what you need for quantum computing to keep increasing these coherence times. Uh, and um, it's, it's really amazing to see that there were orders of magnitude gain term, in terms of um, in terms of making progress, and and this progress um, is 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 important to note uh, has required that there was very substantial gain in in terms of understanding very um, uh, various aspects of the physics of these devices. So so in many ways, looking at quantum computing challenges our understanding of these devices uh, in um, in uh, in manners that were were, were not required prior prior to this work. So you have to understand find details of the physics in order to keep making making this uh, mis this progress. So um, so so um, this these developments in this field and in the field of quantum computing in general um, uh, outline the point that harnessing the power of quantum devices requires exquisite understanding of the of the physics and um, uh, in the in the case of superconducting devices and and the solid state devices in general, um, you need to work with these manageable simple models uh, that describe the quantum mechanics of the systems. But this comes with many layers of models and approximations in terms of physics, and lots of this physics was not explored prior to to doing quantum computing. And um, even now, after uh, more than twenty years of of um, looking at the systems as, as potential quantum bits, there are very hard uh, open questions around the physics that are important in order to make progress. This, for example, one, one question, for example, is, is the role, uh, what, what the role of surfaces and interfaces is in um, limiting quantum coherence. Another interesting challenge has to do with the fact that there are uh, excess excitations in superconductors that are not explained. And, and um, recently, one of the uh, one of the um, uh, potential causes for this that was that was put forward is uh, is in fact cosmic radiation that affects these ships. So, so one one ends up looking at effects that are are very surprising and and very hard to understand. And we we'll need to we we'll need to keep doing the work in order to to make uh, to, to to take things further in terms of developing quantum computers. So. Um, so now, um, to make to make quantum computers useful, it's it's important to uh, to to first of all, um, uh, yeah, fo focus the discussion for starters on on one model of quantum computing, and 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 there are essentially several models of quantum computers that are that are being considered. Uh, the the model that is 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 being looked at by most of the community is the so-called gate-based or circuit model or universal quantum computing approach, and this model essentially relies on initializing a quantum system in a well-defined state, applying a sequence of gates and and measurements. So so you have a sequence that is very similar to the way you run a, a, an algorithm on a on a regular computer in a sense. Um, and uh, when you look at 
um, what is powerful about quantum computers, this essentially has to do with the with with how quantum algorithms scale with the size of the problems that need to be solved. So, um, so whether a certain application can should, can can be better solved by a quantum computer is essentially being looked at from the perspective of, of whether scaling of the algorithm uh, complexity with size is better than in regular uh, computers. So, um, so one uh, fundamental obstacle uh, in in quantum computing uh, are, of course, errors. And um, uh, to start with, uh, we 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 should recognize that, of course, errors are present in classical computers. Uh, we uh, rarely talk about them because they are very small. There are relatively straightforward techniques to to deal with errors, and and they usually rely on redundancy of encoding information. And uh, the other aspect that helps is that these error rates are are extremely small uh, in um, in state of the in state of the R CPUs, um, and um, they are essentially so small that you can run um, uh, a, a, a very large number of cycles without any error. So they rarely come into the picture, although they do come into the picture uh, sometimes. And there are some interesting uh, some interesting papers on, on on this. So now when you talk about quantum computers, errors are, are present as well. And there is here um, one one very interesting uh, uh, discussion in the early days of quantum computing was around the fact that quantum computing, in a sense, is a form of analog computing because you use the superpositions I mentioned earlier that are described by arbitrary numbers. So, um, so for a while, uh, there were arguments uh, uh, against uh, the possibility of doing quantum computing based on the fact that uh, uh, Quantum computers are analog systems, but um, uh, it was uh, it was discovered later that error correction is is possible, and this was uh, uh, one of the biggest breakthroughs in the um, in the field. So error correction relies again, in a sense, on 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 a form of redundancy. Although the fact that you deal with with analog information makes the implementation of error corrections quite quite a bit more more challenging. So now. Um, I, I want to just say a bit about, about one approach to error correction. So this is a large area, but there is this, this, this approach that is based on um, uh, placing a qubit shown here as the, um, as the full, uh, uh, as, as the dots, the, the, um, uh, the full circles uh, on a square grid. Uh, and essentially measuring errors by by measuring um, uh, properties of neighboring uh, qubits uh, around um, uh, around the point on this grid. So this approach called the surface code approach um, is very interesting because it it is very forgiving when it comes to error rates. So it it allows error rates of the order of one percent. But this comes with a price, um, namely. In order to do a useful quantum computation for which you need um, about tens of thousands of qubits, uh, you end up having to implement possibly around tens of millions of physical qubits to, to achieve that task. So, so there is a huge overhead in terms of um, in terms of implementation and of error correction. This estimate, which is actually uh, somewhat outdated, uh, is, um, of course, uh, dependent on how good the physical error rates to, are to start with. And there has been continuous progress on this, um, some, some very interesting developments in this area as well. So, so things keep mo moving forward, but still one has to deal with this huge challenge of um, of the overhead that is required when, when doing uh, error correction, so we need to we need to think seriously about scaling um, the number of qubits from current state of the art, which is around um, uh, fifty or so for this approach to to quantum computing, um, to uh, a very very large number, many orders of magnitude larger. And when uh, when thinking about how to do this, um, some some challenges uh, become visible. One one is uh, simply associated with the physical size of these devices. So these devices are fairly large, and in fact, um, based on the current understanding of quantum coherence, you need to keep them very large in order for their for them to be coherent. So um, so basically. 
Uh, if you extrapolate the size of, of currently around 100 micrometers to, to millions of qubits, you end up with systems that are, are physically simply too large to, to manage in a regular cryostat. One has to think about ways to possibly scale down sizes or, or, or other tricks. And uh, we know, at least for now, that this, this scaling down uh, is expected to come uh, uh, to come with some challenges in terms of preserving uh, coherence. Another important challenge has to do with the fact that you also need to ensure that there is uh, adequate, uh, adequate uh, electronics used for quantum control. And this requires, in the context of this field, um, developing uh, approaches that are compatible with operating these electronics at low temperature, which is, again, seen as a, as a very challenging task. So, so these are uh, so 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 there are very interesting um, questions um, lying ahead in terms of how how the how the development of, of technology will will pursue will, will be pursued. Um, to close, I just wanted to 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 give um, to to give a perspective of where things are are now, uh, and I want to start with one recent uh, uh, groundbreaking result that that has already uh, um, uh, been um, uh, obtained for for a couple of years now, namely the so-called quantum supremacy experiment. So this is an experiment done um, first at, at at Google, where they uh, demonstrated that. Quantum computers can be used to achieve a task in a way that is uh, significantly more efficient than uh, with, with classical computers. So this task uh, is, a, is a relatively uh, particular type of, of, of problem, but, but seeing the fact that quantum computers can handle it in a way that is, um, that is uh, better than with, with regular computers is, is by itself a very, uh, very important milestone for the field. Then to, to uh, build quantum computers, there are uh, several, um, uh, several things that, 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 uh, that come into the picture. The first is that we, keep, we need to keep working on improving uh, quantum coherence uh, because, again, this means that the overhead in error correction will, will get smaller. Um, another interesting approach and one where our, our group uh, as, as, as I said, um, on, on which our group has done some recent work as well, is the use of uh, multi-level systems. So this means encoding information not in two-state systems, but other quantum systems in multiple states. There are some interesting results that point in the direction of this um, uh, providing advantages. But then also uh, for the past few years, there, there, there's been um, uh, a great development in, uh, in the area of doing non-error corrected quantum computing. And essentially this area is about investigating uh, the power of quantum computing um, when error correction is, is not implemented. So this is, this is done uh, in anticipation of the fact that uh, having scalable quantum error corrected computers will, will take a very long time. Um, so in the meantime, it's useful to understand what can be done without error correction. And there are a range of approaches here. Uh, sometimes they are called heuristics and um, uh, these include methods such as quantum annealing, uh, quantum optimization, uh, algorithms and, and machine learning. And a lot of work is being done to quantify uh, 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 the potential of these methods. And with this, um, uh, I would like to, to end, uh, and uh, I'm very happy to take your questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Adrian, for an excellent presentation. You covered a lot of ground, and you explained the concepts in a very approachable and a very a very accessible manner. So thank you for that. We have a few questions. I'd like to uh, put a couple of questions to you. Uh, one question is that has your work in quantum computing <clears throat> enabled you to better understand regular computers at a technology organization basis or logical architecture? And how has this informed your perspectives on improving to change the design and implementation? Yeah, so, um, so, so if the question is uh, about the work done by our group in particular, do I understand this correctly in this way? I can tell you a bit about some of the work we have been been doing recently. So um, yeah, so um, one of the um, one of the topics we worked on was quantum annealing. So this is um, one of these uh, 
non-error correct uh, corrected approaches that I that I mentioned on my my last slide. And um, uh, in in uh, this field, you deal with specific challenges regarding um, regarding control of of um, uh, of this system. So you need to. Um, you need to apply uh, electrical signals to control the parameters uh, in uh, in the Hamiltonian of a of a, of a multi qubit system, and um, well, building um, uh, that type of of uh, system, we we realize that crosstalk between electrical signals uh, is a very significant challenge, and. Um, we um, we developed an approach to crosstalk calibration that um, uh, has uh, some interesting properties in in terms of uh, what kind of uh, cost it has, uh, how it scales with the size of the system, and, and so on. So that that is um, uh, that 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 result uh, can impact quantum annealers and and more generally quantum um, uh, superconducting quantum devices. And another another result that I wanted to mention is demonstrating uh, some of the building blocks of implementation based on so-called QDIT. So these are D-level systems. So instead of uh, having two two-dimensional systems, you use, use multi-level systems. So we did experiments where we quantified the fidelity of gates in this context, which is very interesting because with the larger with the larger size system, the complexity of control increases in in uh, uh, very significantly. So, so we did we did work that uh, that uh, gives gives a benchmark that can 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 be useful for for further developments in uh, in, in this area. So. Okay, thank you, uh, Adrian. Uh, that's that's great. Another question is: um, so scientists such as Roger Penrose have theorized the function of a biological neural network relies on quantum effects. Do you see quantum computers playing a role in AI? And you did talk about the uh, non-error correcting quantum systems and how they're used for machine learning or optimization more generally. Can you just maybe uh, talk a little bit more uh, about that? Yeah. So this is this is a very um... This is a very intriguing, intriguing question. I, um, uh, our work in this area is so. We, so we started in this area fairly recently. So I don't. I. 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 I think I'm far from being able to to talk from the um, uh, from the position of an expert. But I. I. I would say that. Um, um there, there are there are here some interesting questions around uh, what the maybe the closest connections would be between these biological uh, neural networks and and other quantum systems that can mimic this behavior so um uh, I, I think what would be interesting is to to think about what are the the the, the um, what what is the sort of closest implementation of a model system that can give us some insight uh in terms of um how bi biological neural networks work. Uh, I, I think for now, in some sense, the hardware is uh, uh, is um, is following a pattern that doesn't necessarily um, uh, look at this connection from a kind of like that doesn't map doesn't map this connection very precise precisely. So I think that that could probably be very interesting uh, uh, future development. And yeah, um, we we uh, there, there is a lot of work done in in this direction. So hopefully we'll see some some more insights soon also with some some support from experiments. Thank you, uh, Adrian. So with that, I'd like to uh, call this session to a close. I appreciate you taking the time to share your insights and foresight with us. And this is such a fast changing field, as you mentioned at the very beginning, and your, your lab, your department is really at the forefront of a lot of these experimental breakthroughs. So we'd love to invite you back in a few months and have to uh, hear from you the changed landscape and insights from the, from the field. So we'd be, uh, uh, you know, happy to happy to have you host you again. But uh, until then, would like to express a very heartfelt appreciation from the Synthetic Intelligence Forum. Thank you so much as well. It was it was a pleasure, and 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 really, uh, uh, I I I had a great experience thinking about preparing this this perspective. And yeah, thank you again for hosting me. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye bye.